welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited about this session and I should say I'm Alex. Uh, I'm part of the EA for Christians team. I've been involved for a good number of years since we kind of founded EA for Christians. So it's been going for a while now and I've been involved in the EA movement since maybe 2015 or something like that. Um, so it's good to be here and thanks for all coming. Uh, in terms of what I get up to in life, I work for the civil service. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been doing that since I graduated from university. Um, and yeah, really, really excited today that we've got David um, coming to speak to us, uh, David Clough. Um, and I came across David for the first time, maybe six months ago, where I read this really exciting uh, document. Um, yeah, David's leading a research project um, and it's on the Christian ethics of farmed animal welfare which no doubt he'll be touching on some of the ideas of in this talk. Um, and yeah, if there's anything I could recommend you doing, get yourself lovely. It's like nice to have something in paper for once nowadays. So and um, walk through lots of really, really important ideas. So that's how I first came across David. Um, he is a professor of theological ethics at the University of Chester, um, has done all sorts of exciting academic stuff before this, uh, and uh, has got a two volume, uh, a two volume kind of, tome which one day i will get around to reading it looks absolutely yeah incredibly important stuff i don't think many people have done something similar to the work he's been doing in terms of uh the christian ethics of animals and and our relationships with animals so um a really really valuable person to be speaking with us today uh and also he's got lots of other projects on the side i think they would, it's probably fair in saying you're someone who uh is keeping lots of important stuff going simultaneously i know you had the, the creature kind project and default veg and um, as well as the, the Christian ethics of farm animal welfare. So I think you're doing one of those nice things of doing the academic research really well and with real rigor, but then looking to put that into action and seeing it have an impact. So we're really, really thankful for you joining us today. Um, let me just paste into the chat before I forget. There's Slido. So if you have any questions, um, do put them on there. I think we're going to try and make some time at the end for any questions, which I'll field. And don't worry about waiting till the end. If things pop into your mind, maybe even have some questions now, which you know you'll want to um, broach. And maybe um, if they don't get touched on fully, we can put them in. So type away as the talk's going on. But um, I think without further ado, David, I'll pass over to you. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, Alex. Uh, thanks to everyone for uh, joining today. I really look forward to the chance uh, to tell you a bit about uh, my work on uh, theology and uh, Christian theology and animals um, and some of the practical outworkings uh, of that. My plan is to talk for about 20-25 uh, uh, minutes uh, which means there should be time uh, for questions so uh, do feel free to uh, stack them up for Alex and me uh, as we go. Um, okay I'll share um, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so as Alex said, um, I'm an academic. I've been working on the place of animals in Christian theology and ethics for getting on for 15 years now. Um, and as I've come to the end of that two volume uh, project a year or two ago, I began to think, how could I, uh, rather than just sort of leave those books on a library shelf and hope people would uh, read them, how could I do some work that would accelerate the reception of this among uh, Christians at large? And so I'm really interested in uh, getting out and talk to, talking to folk about uh, why this should be an issue Christians should care about. And so very grateful for this opportunity at uh, your conference uh, today. So where we're going in the next 25 minutes is I'm gonna try and answer five questions. Um, are farmed animals a priority? Why is this an issue for Christians in particular? What's the problem in relation to farmed animal welfare and animal agriculture? What's the solution um, and what look like effective routes to change? So uh, starting with number one, are farmed animals a priority? Um, so I think this is a really good question to start with uh, whenever um, I introduce this question to uh, a new audience, because I think there's a really plausible initial objection, which says, um, there are really pressing human problems in the world. How could you possibly think that Christians ought to be concerned for uh, animals? Uh, and, uh, and there are three answers I want to give to that question. Uh, first of all, I think farmed animals are priority because, um, sorry, here is illustrations of climate and human justice issues that you might think uh, are more important than paying attention to uh, farmed animal stuff. Um, so I want to give three answers to why animals should be a priority. And the first is urgency. And um, the best way I can illustrate why this should be an urgent issue is to look at a couple of pie charts. 
This first pie chart shows the relative biomass between farmed animals and wild land mammals in 1900. So by the time we got to 1900, we'd so far expanded animal agriculture that the combined biomass of all farmed animals was three and a half times that of all wild land mammals. And then in the next hundred years, we nearly quadrupled the biomass of farmed animals. And that was a major factor in the halving of wild land mammal biomass. So by the time we get to 2000, the combined biomass of all farmed animals is 24 times that of all wild land mammals. So we've completely monopolized the productive capacities of the earth in order to uh, raise massively increasing numbers of uh, farmed animals. And that's uh, causing serious problems for uh, wild animals populations. We're living through a, a mass extinction crisis. 60% of the uh, biomass of uh, uh, wild animals when I was born is no longer there in the last uh, uh, half century. So this is a really urgent uh, issue. If we don't address uh, the rise in animal agriculture shortly, uh, wild there'll be virtually no wild animals uh, left. Here's a chart of increasing uh, global uh, meat consumption uh, in a uh, period from 1960 to 2010. Uh, and uh, UN forecasts suggest that uh, uh, meat consumption globally is likely to increase if we carry on a current trajectory by another 50% by uh, mid uh, 21st century. So this is a, uh, the question about how we could reverse this uh, trend. So that's my case for it being an urgent issue. Second, I want to suggest it's an issue we can care about alongside uh, human uh, justice issues um, and the environment because we can multitask. We don't have to have uh, one issue. We can, we can think about more than one moral issue at a time. We don't have to drop everything else uh, if we pick up uh, animals as uh, a concern. Uh, and thirdly, I want to suggest that it's really important to pay attention to animal agriculture and farmed animal welfare because it intersects with other things that we care about. I'll give you three quick pictures of that intersection. First of all, um, it's a problem for what we're doing in relation to animal agriculture is a problem in relation to human food and water security. So we currently feed about a third of human consumable cereal crops globally to farmed animals rather than feeding them to humans. And the efficiency of doing that is about 8%, 0.8%, feeding, feeding a crop to farmed animals and eating the animals rather than eating the crop uh, directly. So even if you were concerned about nothing other than human food security, what we're doing in relation to animal agriculture is a seriously bad idea. And uh, water security is a growing problem too, and there's a parallel problem uh, there. So uh, if you're concerned about human food and water security, we need to be concerned about animal agriculture. Second, if you're concerned about the environment, we need to be concerned about uh, animal agriculture. Animal agriculture contributes about 14.5% of all carbon emissions globally, and there's, so, there's no plausible route to carbon neutrality without addressing emissions from food. Um, and there's another problem, uh, a very particular problem with um, uh, this is a picture from uh, South America. So in Brazil um, and other countries, uh, rainforest is being burned in order to clear ground either for grazing cattle or for growing uh, soy, which is almost all of which is being fed to cattle. We import massive amounts of soy from Brazil and other South American countries in order to feed farmed animals in the UK. So we have a direct link through patterns of consumption in the UK to this burning of uh, rainforest, which is obviously catastrophic in relation to uh, climate as well as for indigenous peoples and uh, wild animals. Um, and third, we're currently living through a global pandemic, and it turns out that animal agriculture has two different uh, plausible routes uh, into uh, pandemic risks. So first of all, uh, animal agriculture, we take land, we push people into close proximity to disrupted natural habitats, which are reservoirs of all kinds of uh, coronaviruses. There are hundreds more where uh, COVID-19 uh, came from. Uh, and so that leads to a significant pandemic degree risk, disease risk. But there's also an issue from uh, creating large populations of genetically sim similar immunocompromised animals in intensive animal agriculture. And so that's an ideal breeding ground uh, for uh, zoonotic diseases. That's the technical term of diseases that can uh, transfer from animals uh, to humans. It's also a massive issue. Uh, so that's another route to pandemic disease risk. But also there's a problem with um, feeding antibiotics to farmed animals to control bacterial infections rather than viral ones. And in the US, about 80% of all 
uh, antibiotics are fed to farmed animals rather than humans and growing the growth of antibiotic resistance through that mechanism is uh, a further serious problem which might even be greater uh, is very likely to be greater than uh, viral pandemic risks so animal agriculture intersects with other things uh, that we care about in relation to human well-being and environment and so it's worth uh, paying attention to so second why is this an issue for christians in particular well um you could read the two volume uh, monograph on animals uh, that Alex referred to at the beginning, but let me give you a sort of uh, few minute overview of uh, the theological work I did in uh, those two volumes. Let's think about major doctrinal headings for Christians of creation, uh, reconciliation and uh, redemption. So starting with creation, uh, the easiest way I think uh, the starting point I find uh, to talk about to Christians Christians about why animals matter in a Christian context is that Christians are monotheists. So because we're monotheists, we believe in a God who is the God of all creatures. Everything that is made uh, uh, is uh, created by God and uh, sustained by God. And we're heir to biblical texts which celebrate the way in which not God not only creates all kinds of creatures, but delights in their flourishing. Uh, have a look at Psalm 104, which sort of celebrates the God who is the creator of all kinds of creatures, each in their own uh, place. So a Christian doctrine of creation recognizes that we worship a God who is the God not just of human creatures but all kinds of creatures and who wills their flourishing, declares them good. Uh, and so if we want to think of a sort of God's eye view on the world and align our practice uh, to that, we need to be seriously attentive to the flourishing of all kinds of creatures alongside uh, human ones. Uh, Second, we could think about uh, Christian uh, beliefs in uh, Jesus Christ as God uh, incarnate uh, and doctrines of atonement um, and um, uh, uh, reconciliation. So often uh, Christians tell the story of uh, Jesus Christ as God becoming human for the sake of human uh, sins uh, and saving humans through uh, God's work on the cross. But if we look more closely at New Testament texts, we find that's a very poor sort of underestimate of the significance of God's work in Jesus Christ. So in John, the prologue to John's gospel, John tells us that the word became flesh and flesh in both Hebrew and Greek is a term common to humans and other animals, that kind of fleshy stuff that we have in common with them. When John talks about why God became incarnate in John 3, 16, it's because God so loved, the Greek word is cosmos, God so loved the cosmos uh, that God sent God's only son. Uh, so we need to re re reckon seriously with the fact that Jesus, uh, the meaning of what happens uh, in Jesus Christ is nothing short of cosmic. And the first uh, Christology is the first theological reflection on the meaning of Christ in the letters to the Colossians and the Ephesians picture the work of God, uh, Jesus, uh, God through Jesus on the cross as reconciling all things in heaven and earth to God's self. So uh, I certainly think that we need to think very seriously about uh, a Christian belief in Jesus Christ as uh, not having significance only for creatures like us, but for uh, all creatures. And thirdly, um, I, I think we need to think more broadly about uh, doctrines of redemption as well. Um, so this is a picture by an American, uh, early American uh, Quaker called uh, Edmund Hicks, who's picturing uh, that Isaiah vision of the wolf lying down with the lamb and uh, humans and other animals uh, living in uh, harmony, as well as uh, colonial settlers uh, and uh, Native Americans are on the left hand side, if you can see uh, that. And, so, and that's just one example of a Christian vision which runs uh, through uh, uh, 2000 years um, of uh, God's redemptive purposes as exceeding uh, the human. If you read through uh, Revelation, we've got all kinds of creatures. In fact, every creature of the air and the earth and the sea uh, circling round uh, the Lamb, singing praise to God uh, in a vision of uh, what happens uh, at the end times. And so we've sometimes uh, had visions of redemption which are sort of a more like a teleporting off of sort of human souls to float about with angels uh, in a in a cloud 
but I think we need visions of redemption which are much more uh, comprehensive. What God creates, God has a reason to uh, redeem. So Christian doctrines of creation, reconciliation, and redemption give us reasons to think very broadly about God's dealings with fellow uh, creatures, including animal creatures, and therefore give us reasons to be attending to their well-being uh, and flourishing. So what then is the problem in relation to uh, farmed animal welfare and animal agriculture? Well, I've talked about some of the problems for the environment and humans already, uh, but I want now to look at what the problem is in relation to farmed animals uh, themselves, those vast numbers uh, that we've uh, uh, seen uh, uh, documented uh, earlier. So what's uh, the problem? Well, let's start with fish because people rarely uh, pay attention to fish, though if you're a Netflix subscriber, perhaps you've seen the documentary Sea Spiracy recently, which uh, names uh, some of the issues here. About half of fish come from wild capture fisheries and the other half come from farming uh, uh, aquaculture, uh, which is a relatively new development just in the last uh, half century or so. Um, and there are, there are complementary problems with both of those. So the problem with wild capture fisheries is we've fished 90% of the fish out of the sea in the 20th century. So that fish stocks are uh, astonishingly uh, low and taking uh, more fish out of the sea is really imperiling uh, ecosystems in a serious way. But also if we begin to take seriously the re fairly recent scientific evidence of the sentience of fish, what we need to reckon with are these are the animals that we don't even bother to slaughter. So, animal, so fish uh, drawn up in these uh, huge nets in industrial trawler vessels, which are circling the uh, British coast as well as uh, many oceans uh, globally. They're uh, subjecting fish to crushing injuries as they're pulled up in the nets and then a slow asphyxiation, often deliberately decelerated by um, uh, refrigeration on the decks uh, of uh, ships. Uh, so there's a real problem in relation to uh, fish welfare at slaughter, in relation to wild capture fisheries. And then in relation to uh, farming environments, um, the, the regulation of fish farming, even in the UK, uh, is very, very uh, underdeveloped. Uh, there's all kinds of protections which exist for other farmed animals which aren't uh, given to fish. There's no attention to uh, environmental enrichment. And so we're taking fish species like salmon and trout that in the wild might migrate hundreds of miles through freshwater into seawater and back again. And we subject them instead to horrifically monotonous sort of concrete tanks uh, for freshwater and then very cramped sea cages uh, when uh, they're uh, taken into uh, salt water. So in terms of welfare, both wild capture and uh, fish farming are seriously deficient in relation to uh, fish. After fish, the most uh, numerous animal uh, we consume at the moment are uh, chickens, and the vast majority of chickens raised for meat are uh, grown in these uh, broiler sheds. We've completely invented a new technology of chicken in the last half decade which has bred chickens uh, through kind of various mutant strains to grow so quickly that they reach slaughter weight in around 35 to 40 days. So I've stood in one of these uh, sheds and held a bird who was just losing her sort of fluffy yellow chick feathers and starting to grow the mature uh, white feathers of her breed. She was 16 days old and that's halfway through her life. And chickens aren't designed to grow that uh, quickly. They suffer very significant leg pain from having these prematurely mature weighty uh, bodies. They never see the light of day. They don't get to do anything apart from eat and uh, rest. That's kind of all they're kind of uh, allowed to do in these intensive uh, conditions. And so um, that kind of broiler chicken system uh, is a really significant problem in terms of uh, what uh, chickens might like to do uh, and, and what and their preferred uh, species behaviors. Uh, There's also a serious problem in relation to uh, laying hens. So battery cages are now banned uh, in the EU and still in the UK. Um, but uh, colony cage systems uh, where hens are kept in a shed in sort of stacked uh, cages in their uh, tens of thousands still um, are legal in the UK and the rest of uh, the EU. And there's also a really serious problem in relation to the male uh, chicks of uh, laying hen strains, uh, which are all killed as soon as they're sexed at, at a day old, as soon as they've hatched. If they're males in these laying hens, they're obviously useless uh, for this process. And so they're culled either by, uh, by, either by gassing 
um, or uh, still legal in the UK, being dropped live into a macerator machine, a sort of grinding uh, machine is the other uh, permitted uh, way of disposing uh, of male chicks. Uh, so serious problems in relation to uh, laying hens too. Uh, pigs um, also uh, weigh heavily uh, on my mind. I got my first uh, view of British intensive pig farming from uh, the inside uh, just about 18 months ago. Uh, and it looked very like this, a very overcrowded uh, st uh, sty. Uh, the pigs almost uh, didn't have uh, room uh, to all stand up uh, together in that sty. EU laws require them to have some enrichment, uh, but the only enrichment was a, a sort of block of wood about uh, sort of uh, uh, so big on a chain that one of the pigs could chew at a time. And these are highly intelligent, socially complex animals. Perhaps you saw headlines about pigs being taught to play a computer game uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and we subject them to this astonishingly monotonous uh, 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 life without ever uh, seeing light of day. So um, most pigs um, raised intensively in the UK, though you can find uh, free range um, organic uh, ones too. Uh, sheep generally uh, do better, but e even in the UK are often castrated uh, and tail docked without anaesthetic, which causes uh, significant pain. Um, and um, it, within the uh, project that Alex described, we're interested in thinking about what it takes for a farmed animal to flourish. And sheep are striking in that uh, the lambs are killed uh, uh, just about uh, between sort of two and six months of age. So we're killing baby animals because that's the consumer preference uh, for uh, meat. So that's a fairly new practice, which uh, f you know, doesn't allow uh, lambs to uh, grow to uh, maturity. These are dairy cattle. About um, one in 10 of the UK dairy herd uh, no longer get to graze grass. They're kept inside in this kind of uh, system for all of their uh, lives because that's a way of increasing their milk production. I'm also really struck in relation to their ability to uh, flourish as animals that calves uh, are removed from mothers often even before they suckle for once from uh, their mother's udders. And so we raise, we take away calves, uh, male calves are either killed uh, as soon as they've been removed or um, are raised for a few months uh, for uh, different kinds of uh, meat. The, the calves are often taken away and raised in sort of uh, in solitary cubicles. Um, and if you begin to recognize cows as fellow mammals, I, I think we're seriously underestimating what sort of maternal deprivation uh, inflicts on those animals, as well as the female animals that are sort of made repeatedly pregnant through artificial insemination uh, and never get to meet their calves, um, and that then are culled for beef after three or four lactations when their milk production uh, declines. Again, this does not look like a flourishing life uh, for these fellow creatures of God. Um, beef cattle in the UK generally have it better, uh, though UK beef farmers are beginning to experiment with uh, the kind of um, cattle feedlots that you may have seen in the US. So here's a photo of a British uh, beef farm and you can see all the animals have take, been taken off the grass uh, and are being fed feed concentrates in uh, crowded uh, conditions uh, rather than being um, out in the fields. And so we need to seriously watch the intensification of uh, UK beef production in that kind of uh, way. So I hope you can see that the way we're currently raising um, farmed animals, even in the UK, which prides itself on higher than average uh, standards of farmed animal welfare, fail to enable uh, farmed animals as fellow creatures of God, a life that's anything like um, the uh, life uh, that they, their wild ancestors would have enjoyed or is anything like um, enabling them to express the kind of species specific behaviors, which, uh, you know, are, are part of what constitutes a, a good life for these particular kinds of animals. Um, and so the, that seems to me a really serious reason for Christians to rethink um, the, this sort of huge growth and intensification of animal agriculture uh, because of what it's inflicting on the farmed animals as well as uh, the problems it's causing for humans and uh, the wider environment. So what then is the solution? 
Well, this is a, obviously a huge and complex uh, question. There's all kinds of issues involved uh, in relation to the uh, ethics of global food systems, uh, which go w way beyond um, animal agriculture. But I, there are two really simple uh, steps that I think um, uh, are that make sense in the even in the light of uh, all of that complexity. And the two things that I I think clearly follow from uh, this analysis is first of all, we need to reduce consumption of animals. We need to reduce consumption of animal products. We need to reverse that steep rise in, in uh, production and consumption that's environmentally unsustainable, disastrous for farmed animals and terrible for human uh, food and water security too. That also helps us address uh, climate issues. Even a government minister said veganism was a, a sensible uh, uh, thing to consider in relation to reaching UK climate goals uh, this week. So reducing consumption is one immediate uh, action uh, that makes sense. And obviously that can be done on an individual basis, but also can be done on a, a corporate basis. Uh, and as I'll say in a minute, um, I'm really interested in getting Christians to think corporately about how we reduce consumption of animal products, including thinking about the kinds of food that gets served in uh, churches. Uh, so first of all, let's, uh, we need to think about uh, ways of reducing consumption. And second, we need to think about ways of improving animal welfare for the farmed animals that we're continuing to farm. So um, you know, some people would say we just uh, abolish um, animal agriculture. Um, but I think for uh, the foreseeable future, for this year and next year and the year after, there are likely to be still far animals who are farmed. And so I think we need to uh, keep that second uh, concern in mind as well for the hopefully declining numbers of farmed animals that we're continuing uh, to farm. We need to think about what kinds of uh, life will enable them to flourish as uh, creatures and think about ways of moving sourcing from um, uh, current si systems, intensive systems that provide poor opportunities to flourishing. Uh, to uh, ones uh, that allow them uh, better opportunities. So those are the two uh, initial um, uh, and widely applicable solutions uh, that I want to suggest are sort of the key takeaway from the problem I've described. So um, lastly, what might be effective routes uh, to change? Well, lots of uh, people are expending energy to try and shift patterns in relation to consumption and production of uh, animals. And you'd be aware there are large and um, fairly well-funded uh, charities that are doing all kinds of uh, stuff to try and uh, change attitudes from uh, sort of fairly uh, sort of humane society in the United States is a huge uh, charity trying uh, a range of methods. You also may have heard of uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals, Peter, who tries kind of more uh, subversive uh, strategies of uh, various kinds. There's lots of people trying uh, different kinds of uh, things. As a Christian theologian and ethicist, I'm highly motivated to engage Christians on this issue. And that's for a range of reasons. Um, first of all, I think Christians are often a more conservative bunch in relation to um, attitudinal uh, change than most. So there might be particular obstacles to reach this constituency. Second, I think a lot of the broad campaigning on animal issues misses uh, Christian and other religious audiences because animal activists tend to be more secular, uh, more like to be secular than um, uh, than uh, an average uh, population. A lot have been influenced by Peter Singer or other atheistic utilitarians that think uh, religion is part of the problem rather than part of the solution in relation to uh, this issue. And so in general, the animals movement doesn't get Christians or other people of faith, or if it, uh, it uh, and if it does try and reach out to them as Humane Society of the United States has tried to do, um, it often doesn't understand the audience well enough to uh, be able to uh, produce a plausible message. So I think there's a huge gap in relation to uh, advocacy among Christians in relation to this issue. Uh, and so I'm really interested in um, uh, looking for opportunities to engage uh, Christians on this stuff. So I'm trying a range of things, um, as uh, Alex has said. Uh, I'm kind of, I feel like sort of like a, a sort of entrepreneurial sort of uh, social activist uh, in this area of my work. So I managed to get a half a million pounds of Government Research Council money for a project uh, to engage UK churches at a national level with farmed animal welfare. So 
six major churches in the UK have been represented at a na national level as partners on this uh, three year project where we've had Christian ethicists, theologians um, and a farm animal veterinary welfare uh, specialist as a research team working in partnership with uh, churches and other groups, including Compassion and World Farming to produce uh, the framework uh, that um, Alex waved before you. And you can uh, get your own free paper copy um, by following uh, that link or you can find a PDF uh, at that website. So it's a 60 page document which is setting out why Christians should care about this stuff, how we could frame um, farmed animal welfare in a Christian context, um, what different species of farmed animals need to flourish and how far that flourishing is enabled by current systems. We evaluate systems as uh, enabling poor, better or best available flourishing. And one really quick action point for any uh, organization is to stop sourcing animal products from systems that we evaluate as poor. And that move means to moving better, which is RSPCA assured, or preferably to best available, which is um, organic, free range uh, dairy or uh, pasture for life, uh, where animals are guaranteed uh, a life um, outdoors. Um, so we're hoping that document could be a really helpful starting point for all kinds of churches and Christian organizations to say, OK, we want some help working out what we should do in this area. Um, here's a study guide. We've got a free um, five minute, uh, vid seven minute video, uh, animated video introducing the project, which you could show at a church meeting. Um, and we're developing sort of other resources to support that framework, too. So if you've got if you're um, part of an organization or a church interested in picking that up, um, if you'd like some help, please uh, get in touch. There's lots of contact information at the website. We'd be really glad uh, to work with you. We're spending the last year of the project trying to get people engaged in thinking how, what they might do uh, on the basis of um, our findings. Um, second, Alex mentioned uh, a nonprofit I set up about five years ago called uh, Creature Kind. So this is trying to engage uh, individual Christians or ch uh, grassroots uh, people in uh, churches um, with animal, farmed animal welfare as a Christian uh, concern. Uh, we've got a range of resources, including a six week uh, course on Christianity and animals with videos and Bible studies and uh, uh, brief sort of theological uh, texts and uh, structures for discussion with a leader's guide and all kinds of uh, stuff. You could think of it as your alpha course for uh, Christianity and animals. All that's freely available uh, via our website. We've got a blog. We've got all kinds of other uh, resources. Um, so if you're interested, do um, take a look at that. And then thirdly, a kind of spin-off from uh, Creature Kind is uh, the default veg policy that um, uh, Alex mentioned. Default veg is a simple policy ask, which I realized needed to, be, needed to go way beyond uh, a Christian or uh, audience. Default veg just says, if you're, if you're involved in uh, catering, uh, make uh, plant-based foods the default. And if people want to eat meat, they can request that um, as a, a special uh, diet. So that could, could really change events uh, catering, but all, could also impact on how you lay out a buffet in um, a canteen uh, and so on. So making uh, plant-based foods the default um, um, and meat and dairy a kind of alternative. So shifting uh, the normal is the uh, principle behind uh, default. Okay, uh, I need to bring my uh, comments to uh, a close, uh, but I hope that's given you a sense of why this might be an issue that Christians uh, want to engage with and how um, effective altruists and others uh, might be able to support work that uh, has really strong potential for shifting attitudes in this area. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Lots to chew on there. Um, we haven't got loads of time, so let's dive into questions. Uh, there's going to be a 10 minute break before the next session. So um, I think we're finishing at 20 past. Maybe let's still a few extra minutes from the break so we can get through some of these questions. So the first one on Slido, and for those who haven't seen it, the link is in the chat. The first question um, is, uh, how does the fact that Jesus ate fish undermine your view seems to suggest that it's sometimes OK to prioritize superficial human interests over animal lives? And obviously, feel free to reject the claim that it undermines your view, David. Um, over to you. Yeah, I mean, it definitely would undermine my view if I was trying to make the case that veganism had been always and everywhere required for Christians, which is obviously not um, what I'm saying. Um, what we need to be attentive to is the difference in context between uh, Jesus's uh, time and uh, our own. Uh, eating fish is not the same act morally 
uh, for us, us today as it was uh, for Jesus. Fish were a really interesting animal in the ancient world. Um, fishing was kind of seen as completely unlike any other kind of uh, farming. It was almost like um, uh, just uh, sort of uh, a sort of gift of God because it was so mysterious. You sort of put down your net and you pulled up the fish. Um, and so this astonishing sort of grace, grace of God. And it's really interesting in that context um, that Jesus is only recorded as eating fish in uh, the Gospels and that there's controversy among the early church about whether eating animals was OK. So um, I don't so um, I so fish fish eating is different for us for the reasons I was uh, describing today about what how we're currently eating uh, fish and the consequences for uh, fish populations and uh, for fish welfare. Um, but it's also interestingly how categorically different fish were understood in the ancient world from other farmed animals. Um, and while probably as an observant Jew, Jesus was eating lamb at the Passover, I think sensitivities about meat eating mean that gospel accounts never have him eating anything other than uh, fish in terms of um, uh, meat. And I, I think that's a really interesting uh, fact in itself. Thanks, David. Um, next question is from JD and says, Give Well estimates that it's roughly $5,000 to save a human life by giving to the Against Malaria Foundation. Um, and animal charity evaluators estimate the same amount frees roughly 10,000 plus chickens from cages. How do you resolve such trade-offs when you've got, a, I guess, a fixed pool of money and you've got to work out what to do with it? So here's where I confess I'm a little bit sceptical about the kinds of calculations that suggest there are trade-offs of that kind. Why and why in, particular, in relation to this issue am I sceptical? Well, um, if we think about the kinds of ways I'm describing the multiple problems of animal agriculture, I think we need to recognize that, uh, that being attentive to the well-being of farmed animals and taking action in response um, is very hard to quantify just in, times of, in terms of that uh, dollars per life um, uh, calculus. What I think we need in relation to beginning to change Christian attitudes on this issue is education. And I see an education that begins to attune Christians to the values of all kinds of creaturely life to have multiple benefits, uh, not, you know, which aren't easily uh, containable within uh, analysis uh, that just uh, tries to uh, do that kind of uh, simple calculus. Um, and so I guess I, I do appreciate that uh, people uh, will want you know be wanting to make choices about where uh, money goes, and it's uh, I think it's appropriate to prioritise uh, human well-being above animal well-being in uh, lots of contexts. But uh, to begin to think about how we can shift patterns of uh, consumption to uh, reduce. Uh, numbers of farmed animals being consumed uh, is very likely, as I've said, to help address climate goals, which are absolutely astonishing in terms of uh, global impacts and human food and water security issues and uh, farmed animal welfare, um, as well as, I think, inculcating in a, a sort of sense, uh, sort of a, a wider sense of our relationship to the creaturely world that is going to have all kinds of unquantifiable uh, uh, results. So I think this is worth having in the mix of things that Christians care about and things that are worth uh, supporting. Great. And I think let's go for one more question. We'll, yeah, we'll go slightly into the break and then people can head off. Um, and this is a question uh, about what diet to aim for. And I think you touched on it a bit, but be interested to hear you expand a bit more. So what do you think is a compassionate yet affordable and healthy diet? Um, the commenter is saying, I haven't seen enough discussions on that so far. So I guess if you were going to offer an idea where you think people should end up with, what would you recommend people adopt in terms of diet? So obviously there's a lot of battling uh, about an identity politics about diet at the moment, which is kind of associated inevitably with a rise in interest in uh, veganism. Um, I think in a Christian context, we need to be generous to each other. So there's Pauline texts on how you treat other people who are eating different stuff to you. I think Christians are called to be attentive and generous uh, to other people who are sort of not quite in the same place on uh, this stuff. And corporately, it seems clear to me that we need to be on a trajectory trajectory towards reducing overall consumption and um, improving uh, welfare. But if we think about that as a corporate goal, 
for some people that could be, oh, I'll just switch to a plant-based diet. That looks uh, something I can do. And by the way, that needn't be um, more expensive. In fact, um, if we learn to cook right, plant-based diets is a much cheaper way of eating and consuming um, animal protein, except where animal, you know, sort of the cheap, pro the cheap processed products of animal agriculture are sort of subsidized and, and, and fed to us um, uh, problematically um, through, you know, fast food um, outlets and so on. Um, so, um, so plant-based uh, can be uh, uh, cheap. Um, it's, it's a sort of greedy and resource intensive choice to be using animal products instead of uh, uh, plant-based stuff. But I think if we can uh, all look for different ways in which we can reduce consumption, um, then, you know, vegans and um, sort of um, flexitarians and um, others can sort of coexist in the church, recognizing we all care about farmed animals, we all care about fellow creatures of God, and we're trying to take the steps we can uh, in relation to reducing consumption and improving sourcing. Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, conscious of time, so I think we should probably draw to a close there. Can I just um, give you all a, give you a big round of, a, round of applause, a virtual, a virtual clap, if that's okay. So. Thanks. Um, a real treat. Thanks for coming to speak to us, David. And yeah, I just want to say, uh, I really, really wholeheartedly recommend that people get the PDF or order the copy from the UK and spend some time chewing through this. It's really interesting stuff. And also, more generally, dream of thinking in the effect out in the community about our obligations towards animals and, and what we should be doing. So if you're interested and you've not come across that kind of material, um, do get in contact with me or else on the EA for Christians team. And we'd love to put you in contact with some of the the literature coming out of the effect artists and uh, effect artists movement uh, thinking about what we can do to help animals so yeah well i think we'll pause there thanks again david and i think we can grab five minutes for a break before we're reconvening for the next session so thanks thank everyone. you